So it's not fully scoped to cover everything. So when the mo money moving, and really will have a huge impact on the emerging market as well. And uh, the money is moving. Uh, it's become ever clear. This chart is very interesting. When the move, money moves, there are two different types of money moves. One is official capital, one is the private capital FDIs. Particularly in the Asia, I want to pick, take, pick, take, pick Asia as a case. What we observe is looking for the second column. Look, not column, look at second lines. This is uh, excluding Japan, Australia, and New Zealand because they do have a capital outflow. So this is for the, all, all the Asians, including, including emerging Asians. The whole capital flow in 10 years horizon from 2001 in 2010, the whole capital flow FDI is a 968 trillion US dollar. So roughly, oh, I'm sorry, billion US dollar. So roughly one trillion, yeah. But if you're looking for the foreign reserve accumulated for the same periods, it's a four point roughly one trillion US dollar. What does that mean? This is an absolutely stunning phenomenon. That means in the 10 years of horizons, Asia have $4 trillion export to the advanced economy. Goes through the official channel, become foreign reserve accumulation. Meanwhile, import $1 trillion as a private capital of FDI. So Asia actually export the low risk capital and import high risk capital. It's a huge global hedge. This is another absolutely amazing features we observe in the past 10 years, see the global exchange on the capitals. So capital is not only one way for advancing economy to the emerging market. Capital not only volatile, it's a two-way capital flow traffickers, but with very different natures. And this is another capital flows Yeah, because of time, I'm going to uh, skip something. So this is also just says how much is volatility we have. The capital is very volatile in the past 20 years. I think I don't need the further explain explanations for those issues as well. What's the drive force for capital flow? We did a survey. The service is very interesting. There's a cyclical issues, there's structure issues. There are push fact, there are pull fact. The push fact means the advanced economy has a policy push the money, move out. The pull fact is the receiving countries have a good condition to attract more capital flows. So it's a two different fact. In, in a cyclical issues, anytime we see the lower US interest rates, capital move out, and then how we see low global risk aversions. When there's low global risk, we see the money move out. And we see the strengths, advancing account balances, we see the money move out. So this is very pretty. For the, from the emerging market recipient point, we see a high commodity price, which the capital receiving, high domestic interest rates, capital moving because interest difference is also very big. And we see a low, low domestic inflation, capital moving. So this is very much associated with cynical issues. But if you're looking for the structure issues, there are more structure issues, much more fundamental issues. There are international portfolio diversification. That's a huge issue. That means 81% of the global financial assets going to diversify it. To where? The emerging market. Because obviously, when the global share half and a half of GDP between the advanced economy and the emerging market low incomes, the financial assets location have moved along with the growth pattern. So this, this is the international portfolio diversification. And obviously, advanced economy low potential growth 
uh, is uh, one reason. Improved emerging market balances, high emerging market potential growth, and trade openings also attract more and more capital inflow. That's the why the reason capital becomes more and more. And we also did another interesting service on, on, on the, the, the asset managers ask what are the major drive force for you to invest in the money? We tell the top five is the, the economic, strong economic growth, solvent debt issues, and the inflation prospects, interest rates, the differentiation between the countries, and industrial or sector specific characters. And those are the, those are the really top five reasons uh, they think that's uh, for the asset managers. It's more or less the same thing if we're looking for, for the, for the, for the pension, pension funds, also economic growth, liquidity, and inflation prospects as well. So if you get these two tables together, the conclusion is very clear. The money is going to moving away from the advanced economy to the emerging market. And there are few more surveys we, we have done in the past looking for what's the drive force for the capital flow, and that's the whole thing. So if I can summarize the whole thing about the capital flows, it's very interesting to see the capital flow is increasing dramatically year by year. Number two, capital flow is very volatile. And number three, and there are two channel capital flows. Official capital flow out of emerging market to the advanced economy, we call it up here capital flow, but the private capital flow move into the emerging market from advanced economies. And the private capital flow also more and more lean on the portfolio investments rather than classical FDI. And, uh, and also, uh, the finally, because the global economic structure change, because the growth gravity is moving away from advanced economy to the emerging market, we expect to see more and more private capital flow moving away from the advanced economy to the emerging market. Now, what's the policy to deal with that? But before that, the whole issue is why do we need a policy to deal with capital flow? Capital flow is wonderful, is it? Capital flow helps you to build the infrastructure investments. You need a road, you need the highways, you need the bridges, you need the ports, you need all those things to help you do that. Capital flow help you deepen your financial market. Right? You need to develop the further instruments in the financial market. You need a broad financial market. You need to deepen the financial market. Capital flow help you with that. What's the problem? Yes. Capital flow can play very important roles, very helpful if the capital is in a nice way moving in and properly in the right place. There are two things absolutely important. Number one, the capital used in the right place. The great case tell us, the Spanish case tell us, just in the past few months, if you borrow all the money into the consumption, you get high debt, you get yourself into deep trouble. The Spanish case also, if you get all the foreign capital, get into the, your property market, end of the day, you get yourself into the trouble. So how do you guard this capital flow into the proper place? It's absolutely a very important issue and also a huge challenge for the countries, the governments, authorities in the region. The second issue, is, as, I, as I said before, the capital flow is a huge and very volatile. It's in and out, out and in, which cause the market volatilities. Recall just a few months ago, when the money move, money move away from Asia, for example, in October last year, the equity market drops roughly 20%. It's not equity market drops. It's a currency market. It's exchange rate drops, for example, in South Korea, in India, in Thailand, in Indonesia. When your equity market drops, you will say it's equity market. Okay, you invest. 
I have no money, so I don't invest in equity markets. It's okay. But if exchange rate change, does it have an impact on everyone? The first the company has a problem because it changes your balances. It changes your cost of your material. It changes your price of your exports. So then the story is very different. Then you see what we see early this year, the capital flow moved back to the region, the stock market go back, the exchange rates go back. Just in four months, just in four months, the region experience exchange rates have a 20% down, 20% off. It's not an easy issue because a huge impact on production. It's not an issue on the equity market. It's not the earning. It's not the profits. It's not the who gain, who lose. It's the macro issue. It's the output. It's a GDP issue. And even don't mention the distribution in impact, who gain, who lose. So the capital flow in general is a very good thing and uh, very helpful. But only two things. If you properly guard this capital flow in the area, you wish this capital flow used to very productive and to, to, to produce the things you need. For example, infrastructures, bridges, railways, or whatever. And in a smooth way. But unfortunately, the capital flow is very market driven. Don't go that way. It's always very volatile and always go to different areas. So then come to the policy uh, issues. How do we have a proper policy to make sure the money will be properly guarded into the proper sector and with a smooth sense, not volatile too much, disturb the stability of the macroeconomy? So there's come the policy issues. And uh, we had so many experiences in these areas before. We have a lot of lessons, very painful lessons even in 1998, when the Asia experienced the financial crisis. So what's the policy? It's not an easy policy to deal with these issues. Before the policy, what we should do is we should ask us the three very fundamental questions. Are macro are macroeconomic policy appropriate? Are there prudential concerns? Is there scope for effective capital controls? It sounds very simple through issues, but actually it's not easy because the first issue is if we can use, say if we can, if we can use the macroeconomic policy, we should not use the capital management policy issues. The second issue is if there's only if there are prudential concerns, that means there's a stability concerns, there's a financial stability concerns, there are macroeconomic stability concerns, we'll be able to apply for some instruments. And the third, we have to have the, the, the institutional capacity to implement the policy. So it is not an easy issue, I have to say. And, uh, and there are basically five policy tools we can use. And first issue of obvious is the physical policy. Everything I talk about is more from the recipient point of view. So when you receive the capital, when capital flow moving in a very dramatic way, how do you deal with this? The first issue is physical policy. Basically, you need a more tight physical policy because at that time, you don't want to have a loose physical policy, so then you will get, get overheating situations. And then you, the second policy will have a monetary policy. So also, you've got to be very careful. You don't have to ease the monetary policy and because you push the liquidity pump, liquidity into the systems, with the capital flow move in, then you, it's very easy to get into the overheating situations and create a bubble. Avoid the bubble is a very important issue when dealing with capital flow as well. And uh, we have a financial policy as well. So we want to make sure the money was get into the system through the financial channel so there's room for, you, for us to manage the capital flow properly goes through all the channels. There, because there's a lot of techni technical issues and uh, given the time uh, concerns, I'm going to skip those issues in, in the fast way, but uh, be more than happy to discuss these issues with you because so many details, very technical. And uh, there are also potential regulations uh, and the capital controls. 
in the potential regulations, a lot of issues, for example, trying to people sort of in some way set the restrictions on the capital flow to real estate sectors. For example, Korea used the, the loan to value uh, ratios to res restrict the capital flow, move into certain area the government do not want to see the capital move in. So there's a lot of instruments in these areas. And also there are capital control methods. You can impose tax, which Brazil is doing, and uh, on the volume things. And you can restrict a certain areas, of residential and the non-residential, even within the residential, how to declassify and uh, impose certain restrictions and, and getting some special lessons. So there are various ways and try to guide the capital flow into the proper areas. So there's a lot of instruments is here. And, uh, but we need to be very careful. Oh, sorry, it's not like, but this is absolutely important slides, but it's not all clear here. I feel a little pity. And uh, it says when you design a, a capital control uh, 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 instrument, you need to concede a few very important issues. The macro, the first two issues, the point to in, employ the capital control method is to dealing with the macroeconomic concerns and the financial stability risks. Only you feel there's two issues will encourage you to use this method. So otherwise, which is not easy, uh, and is, is not a proper way to do that. But let me do, uh, do a few uh, 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 the, the explanations. So we try to bring all the countries into the picture to see how these countries are doing the capital control methods uh, in the past, because it's obviously such an important issue, and uh, every country has used very different uh, methods and its ways. So this is very much in the emerging market. So f basically, we will have is called the economy-wide capital control methods. This is one cycle. We have uh, uh, here is the forex regulations, just for the capital inflow regulating methods. We have a macro potential measures. This is includes the the, the, the value. Uh, loan to, to the, the, the value ratios, all the other things, and they always, sorry, it's really difficult to see it. Financial sector capital control, you, you, you put a certain restriction on the financial sector, make sure the channel was controlled, so the money goes through in a certain way managed. So this is a lot of way to do that. But this is overall, we see the country, this is Bulgaria here, they use a very much economic-wide assistance, and we see uh, Egypt is here, so you use a two, uh, sort of a uh, type of type of methods with the forex regulation and the macro potential instruments as well. So how much overlapping mean the country use how many instruments? So then, oh dear. <laughs> no, it's, it really cannot explain that. It's really hard to see. Sorry. OK, so I guess I just skip the few and just go back to this fundamental one. Yeah. What we found is, I think what we tried, what we found is the world is beautiful, it's lively. So all these countries use a different combination of instruments to dealing with capital flow in a different way. And obviously have a different impact. And someone works very well, someone we don't. But what we try to say is, oops, it's gone. Why the picture is gone? There's some, there's an invisible hands, works for me, and uh, very well, yeah. But anyway, uh, I guess we cannot see that in a clear way. Um, but the whole thing, this is uh, quite a lot of detail here. What we try to see is, in the different countries really use a very different method to manage these very, very complicated, complicated issues. So if I put in this, all these policy issues together, I think uh, the three key issues, number one, you have to ask yourself you know, whether this macro policy is okay, and whether it's a potential concerns, or whether you have institutes to support implementations. 